was as I was preparing for the message, um, somebody came, an old friend came to the door, you know, and just sat down to get serious and uh, sat down. And I hear the door. And I haven't seen this person in a long time. So I open the door and I'm polite. How's it going? You know? And he's like, it's been a long time. I saw you through the window. You're reading a book. What are you doing? Oh, I was just studying to give a message. Uh, a message on what? From the Bible? Yeah, the book of Ephesians. So he says to me, the book of Ephesians? Which chapter? <laughs> I hadn't seen this guy in a long time, so I was wondering what he was getting at. <laughs> I said, Ephesians chapter 2. He says, oh, he goes, you're getting deep in, eh? That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's where Paul talks a lot about the Old Testament. And so I'm like, yeah, okay. he mentions the Old Testament, mentions some things from that. He says to me, don't you find most of the Old Testament's intense? I go, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Exactly what I'm, I said I meant, like, uh, don't you find most of the Old Testament is intense? So I said, well, you have to be more specific and give me an example. So he said, Abraham was in a tent, the Jews were in a tent, the tabernacle was in a tent. Good job, <laughs> Keep the tradition of cheesy jokes going before the sermons will pass you've been saved, in verses 8, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's workmanship. The word workmanship comes from a Greek word, and I might be saying it wrong, but the, that word is poioma. And it it means the result of work, something created, something composed or constructed, something that is made. We get our word poem from the Greek word for workmanship. And I was just thinking that it's very fitting that Paul uses the same word to describe God's creation in the universe. In Romans 1.20, the word poioma is used for the four words of what has been made. In Romans 1.20 it says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, Oyoma. God's masterpiece. So, we see that 
is a God is a master poet. He uh, he's called in the Bible the author of our salvation and the finisher of our faith. And he also wrote the book that we we treasure. The word of God. Now it takes faith to believe in the master poet. Uh, a lot of people say to you, how do you know that you know, the word of God is the word of God? How do you know that Jesus died for your sins? How do you know? There's a lot of how do you know. And they all say, well, faith is, you know, just a crutch. But Hebrews 11, 6 tells us, for without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The finished work of Christ is offered to all, but can only be accessed by faith. And Genesis chapter 1 says that the master poet spoke the universe into creation. And Hebrews 11 verse 3 says that by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In the same way that the universe and all the nature, all the nature is God's poetry, things in the heavenly realm that we cannot see are also God's poema, God's composition, God's word of art. And I want to go to, uh, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to be talking about Genesis 12, where Abraham, when he was, actually when he was Abraham, we read of um, God making the first, God uh, approaches Abraham, Abraham for the first time. And uh, he says to him that he was going to make a, he makes a promise, he makes a covenant, which is a binding agreement, where he makes a promise and then he has Abraham also keep a promise to him. And uh, more like he commands Abraham to do something. And so in uh, Genesis 12 we read that, we read God saying to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. This is his promise to Abraham. And I will bless you, and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I'm not saying the whole verse, but that, that's some of it. And he also talks about how he's going to make his name great. And uh, we read that God found Abraham's heart to be faithful. I read that in Nehemiah. And God then made a covenant with him. And in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 17, God changes Abraham's name to Abraham. Abraham. As we know, Abraham means uh, exalted father, and Abraham is father of many, because he promised that many nations would come from Abraham, and uh, especially the nation of Israel. So this is the beginning of Israel, where we see God establishing his covenant with Abraham, and uh, changing his name to Abraham. And we read also, that as it goes on, we read in Genesis 17, that God's going to establish his everlasting covenant between Abraham and God. And even God says, and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And then you go on further in, in verse 11, God says, you are to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And then he goes on to say that any, any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people broken my covenant. And we read, we read on that very same day Abraham took his, his son Ishmael and every male in his household and circumcised them. And I was thinking it, it probably took the men of the household just as much, maybe not just as much faith, but Abraham came up to him and told me, God told me I got to circumcise you today. <laughs> um, so we've got to ask ourselves, what came first, faith or <clears throat> circumcision? And we read, in, we read that Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And we read in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, that Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. What can we learn from Abraham, the patriarch of Israel and father of faith? We can learn that faith doesn't follow works. Works don't lead to faith, but faith precedes work. And in Hebrews 11, uh, verse 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When the, when the master poet gave the command to Noah to build an ark, when he instructed
instructed Moses on how to build the tabernacle and construct and transport the tabernacle. When he gave David the instructions to Solomon to build the temple, all these workers have something in common. Their faith precedes their work. Why? Because it is not their work, but God's workmanship. He gave, them the, he gave them the instructions, the design, the measurement, the materials they had to use, what it was to be used for, how to use it, the purpose behind it. And when he made covenants and promises and gave them rituals and feasts and laws, he was giving them calculated and meticulous direction in every step of the way. Why was he doing this? I was asking myself. Because everything God, everything God shared with Israel, at this point, not the other nations, everything God shared with Israel, was a shadow, a pattern, an example. A lesser rep representation of something much greater in the heavenly realm that was to come. And so, uh, we, then it comes after that, we follow in our Bibles, we, we get to Moses and we hear that the, the law is given to Israel. say all the uh, chapters and verses. But this is De Deuteronomy uh, chapter 10, 12, or 16, and if you have any questions after about something I might have left out by accident, you can come and ask me, because uh, I have, I do have it written down, and I do know where I took it from. But this is in Deuteronomy when the law was given to Israel, and um, Moses is obviously telling the nation of Israel what God had commanded them to tell them. Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. And he goes on to say, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. We know that uh, flesh circumcision is a cutting off of the foreskin. And it was to be a sign. It wasn't, it wasn't the circumcision, as we read before, Abraham was made righteous before he was circumcised. Um, the flesh circumcision was a sign to, a sign of their separation as a nation, a sign of their obedient heart. An outward sign of an inward obedient heart. And because we, we also read in, in Hebrews 10 that the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities. For this reason, it can never be by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. So it wasn't the, the actual circumcision that was making anybody perfect, but at the same time, if you weren't circumcised on the eighth day, and if you weren't a descendant of Abraham, you weren't a Jew. So in a way, the two were tied together, but... We're going to go more into detail here in uh, Ephesians. We'll go back to Ephesians reading verses 11 through 22. Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. Uh, why is Paul reminding us that we were Gentiles, which is, which is a word that means nation. It's um, basically all nations apart from the nation of Israel are Gentiles. And uh, like I was saying, Gentiles in the flesh, or in the NIV it says by birth, but Gentiles in the flesh uh, was anyone born that that wasn't circumcised? Uh, sorry, that was Gentiles by the, in the flesh were not circumcised and were not a descendant of Abraham. And uh, oh yeah, he was saying. I was saying, why would Paul want to remind us that we weren't Gentiles, we weren't uncircumcised, we were we were separate from Messiah. We didn't have the promise of of the Christ that was their promise. We were excluded from citizenship in Israel. 
We were foreigners to the covenants of promise. We were without hope. We were without God in the world. And the reason he's doing this is because he just said in the previous verse that it is not of works. And how can the, he's talking to the Gentile church in Ephesians, how could they take claim of, of having worked for it when, you know, as human beings, we often take credit for things that are good. Even if we had, you know, if something turns out bad and we had everything to do with it, we like to pass the buck. But if <laughs> the situation's reversed, we'll take credit for things we didn't even do sometimes. I, I think that has a lot to do with pride. But I also think that you see throughout the course of history, even when um, in Egypt, when the, the Israelites were taken out of slavery, they were taken out of bondage. And they wanted to go back, even though God had just done an impossible task of liberating them and they wanted to return because they were they were becoming ungrateful and they were not seeing things through the eyes of faith but look here we're in the desert this is taking too long they're getting impatient and we can be very much like that I mean it was human it's human nature and as we know human nature is sinful but it's not just the Jews that were sinful you know but they had the law to separate them from the rest of us sinners and so but Paul here is, is making a point that it's not by works. We can't, the church, or especially especially the church now, because we're so, this is years and years later to the letter to Ephesus, but he's, he's uh, reminding them that you guys weren't around. So, you know, remember, he starts off with remember that you were Gentiles by birth, uncircumcised, separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel. So basically all the things that would get you to a right relationship in God, they had not been doing. So furthering, making his point, uh, further making his point that uh, they had nothing to do with the work that was being done in their life. Um, yeah, they were in a, okay, so they were in a hopeless situation. But we're gonna read about the good news, and um, we've already read about it in the previous chapter that we've been put in the body of Christ. I'm going to read it again because now I'm at Ephesians.
and we have a high priest that enters the most holy place every year, uh, not every year, sorry, one time, because on earth they had to enter every year to do this, but Christ just did it once, the finished work of Christ. We read, um, and I believe it's, why did I not write the book? It's, it's Hebrews, but I can't remember what chapter it is. I think it's chapter 9, verses 11 through, that's just such a good chapter too, uh, Hebrews 9, because it really goes into detail, Hebrews 9, 10, 11. It's exactly what we're talking about now. Like If you want to go into that too, there's more homework for you. <laughs> I'm going to have questions for you the next time they let me preach. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there it is. In, um, we're going to talk, there's so much you can say, there's so many directions you could go in talking about the blood of Christ because that's how precious the blood of Christ is to us. He, he shed his life blood for us. Holy sacrifice. When Christ came as high priest, yes, this is in Hebrews chapter 9, verse, verse 11. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves. Remember I was saying that the invisible realm was created by the, the master poet just as much as what we can see was created by the master poet. So, he did not enter by means of the goat, blood of goats, and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. You remember Moses had to go around throwing blood everywhere? <laughs> he'd, be, he'd be covering uh, the altar. I mean, they were, where is that? That's when Moses had proclaimed every command of the law. Yeah, that, that's in verse 16. It goes on to say, uh, Sixteen through, oh yeah, nineteen, uh, verse nineteen of chapter, the same chapter. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll on all the people. He said, "This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you, which God has commanded you to keep." In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. We know in the Bible God says that the life is in the blood. So this is, we're dealing with a dead nation, but God chose this dead nation apart from all the Gentiles, the other dead nations. And he's, I'm going to deal with you, I'm going to explain to you that life is in the blood. And he goes through this awesome book explaining all these things. So, to get back to the blood, we're going to go backtrack to, in chapter 9, go to verse uh, 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offer himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 6, he says, For in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision have any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The, um, that, was, that was what I was talking about when I said that faith precedes works. Our faith is our love for God being worked out in our walk. Uh, chapter, uh, where am I here? Day after day. Uh, I don't even know what this is. Sorry about this, my notes are uh, Romans 7. Oh, yeah, I'll finish with this. So, Romans 7, verses 1 through 8. We read about, here we're comparing the law to uh, marriage. And circumcision for the Jew was supposed to be like a wedding ring. <clears throat> a wedding ring doesn't necessarily mean somebody is faithful to their spouse. You can, God said that if you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. And so we know that it's a heart, a sin is, is rooted in the heart. 
In Jeremiah it says uh, that our hearts cannot be trusted. And so what I'm trying to say here is the reason circumcision didn't work was because they were they were trusting their, their law rather than the, their faith in God carrying out the law. The, uh, the law was perceiving the works at that point. So in marriage, we read in, in verse, verse 7, we read that as long as a person lives, they're bound to their husband or wife. And what I was trying to say about the, the, the circumcision, how God was commanding them, it was in their law to be circumcised with a heart, to have a heart change. And circumcision was just an outer expression of an inward of an inward um, heart desire, of, of a heart change. So it's the same thing with, the reason he's comparing it with marriage is because it's the same thing. A wedding ring doesn't necessarily, a wood, it's just a ring on your finger. But what is, what, where does your heart, what does your heart feel about your spouse? So in the same way, God says that the law in the same uh, context of marriage, you had in order to to be released from marriage, somebody had to die. So you're you're bound to your husband or wife until death, until death do us part. So when somebody died, they were no longer the law of marriage did not did not hold them down anymore. Not <laughs> so I'm making it sound bad, but <laughs> I'm tired. I was up all night trying to work on that. Finish this up. So. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like what I'm trying to say by that is they were no longer the law no longer counts to a dead person, right? So when, when we died with Christ, we died with him. This is what baptism, uh, baptism represents, right? We die with Christ and we're resurrected with Christ. And at that point, the law doesn't hold us accountable anymore, Jew or Gentile. And we're going to be talking about that later on where God takes the Jew, he takes Israel, he takes the Gentile, he puts them in one body, and there's no such thing as Israel right now. There's no such thing as Gentile right now. We, we go around, we're looking with our eyes, we're like, there's Jew, there's Gentile. <laughs> you know, we read the Old Testament, we think we're still in it. But then, <laughs> when we read about the new creature that God created, that we're going to get more into detail right now, uh, another time, but well, if you do your homework, you can get into it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> So God made this new creature, and that's what matters right now, the church. The church is the body of Christ. And his life's blood has been shed. He purchased the church with his blood. And so on that note, um, I'd just like to say thank you for listening to me. And <laughs> let's say prayer together. Um, uh, on this verse, how much more than, I'll repeat this verse, how much more than will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Thank you, Jesus, for your life's blood. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for living and dying and, and coming back to life and giving us life. We died with you and we came, we came back. And now we're not held under, we're not held any under practices or laws which you've given to Israel, but we are, we are free in Christ to love you, to, to express our love for you through the works that you've pre prepared in advance for us to walk in. Lord, we are, the church is your workmanship, Lord. The church is the body of Christ. You are our head. Let us be obedient in just walking in newness of life and walking in a life that is so much better than the world around us that we see with our eyes, Lord. You are the creator of the invisible realm. Help us to start to see with our eyes of eternity rather than material eyes, Lord. We're in a world with a lot of distractions, but we don't we don't have to be distracted by them. Lord, I pray that we would be a church, Lord, that just grows in our newness of life, that cherishes the blood of Christ, and cherishes the work that you've done for us, the redemptive work, and doesn't take it for granted, Lord. We're not any better than, than the Jews. They were, they, I think that when we read them, we see an example of how easily the human beings they represented all of us, really, in the sense that human beings can so easily forget where you've taken us from, forget the pit you've taken us out of, 
And if we're honest with ourselves, we can see today that we're not where we need to be. But you, Lord Jesus, have put us exactly where we need to be, which is in your body. Thank you, Jesus, for the church. I just pray that this word spoke to somebody today, and I thank you for having uh, put it on my heart to, to read it. So um, let us all walk today 